Hello, everybody. Welcome back to the conversation series. I am very excited today because I have a fellow podcaster here with me. I have Javier Leva here with me, host of two different podcasts, uh, Pretend and then Criminal Conduct. And I'm very excited to have him here with me. And I'm going to turn it over to him and let him introduce himself. Danielle, thank you so much for inviting me. Oh. So like you said, my name is Javier Leva, and I host two part podcasts. Yeah. The first one was pretend it's a show about con artists and people pretending to be someone else. So I actually go after these con artists and, and yeah. try to interview them, which is nuts. And then th my second podcast is called criminal conduct, where we take one case per season, very much like serial. My co host is a former Secret Service agent, and he's a private investigator, and he has some oh, yeah. super duper secret government clearance that I have no idea what he actually does. But yeah. uh, it, it's it's an interesting podcast and we're working on season four right now. We're actually I'm flying to St. Louis next week. I, I want to start from the beginning with you because I met you, uh, you know, this past summer and it was so interesting to hear what you've created with Pretend. How did Pretend come to be? You know, when I started pretend podcasting was still a hobby for most people. Like it wasn't even fathomable that this could be like a like a full-time gig, which is not it's not my full-time gig. But people make a living off of podcasting. It really is. But back then, it was just something that I wanted to do to help me pass the time and and have like a creative outlet. Yeah. And the show started off as a very <laughs> not about con artists it was about people pretending to be someone else but like ghost writers and com stand-up comedians who had to like assume a character in order to accomplish their performance right yeah. it was like a very artsy fartsy show and then i talked to my um <laughs> my con artist cousin who had just been released or I don't know he was in the process of going into federal prison and so I, I knew that he was you know the black sheep of the family but I never knew exactly why he was going to prison and so he sat down and we recorded it and he told me everything and my jaw dropped and that's when I realized okay this show is about yeah. con artists way more interesting than ghostwriters and yeah. stand-up comedians is, is that where your fascination came from for con artists? Like, where does that fascinate, fascination? I actually don't have a fascination for con artists. I kind of fell into it. I don't yeah. even like true crime. Um, but, I, you know, I kind of fell into the true crime space. And, and so, like, all my podcasts are true crime. And con artists do fascinate me. I don't think I came into it thinking I'm fascinated with con artists. So let me dissect them. Um, no, it was really more like, Oh, I stumbled onto this world and right. you meet one con artist and then you meet another one that does like a snake oil salesman or I interviewed a cult leader and then I interviewed the the king con artist of them all, Frank Gabagnell. And then you start getting these patterns start emerging that these people are using the same tactics. It doesn't matter if they're selling you a miracle drug or se selling you salvation, you yeah. know, they're, it's yeah. all the same. Now I met you when you were doing all of your stuff with Frank Abagnale. How, <laughs> like, how do you kind of figure out, okay, this is the next con artist I'm going to look at. Like, how does that kind of formulate in your mind? Well, when you become a con artist connoisseur like I am, <laughs> you start to realize that, you know, you should probably go after some of the heavy hitters, right? And yeah. Frank Abagnale, I mean, he is the con artist of all cons, right? Yeah. Like he's yeah. he's the original George Santos. <laughs> because what I realized was that he is not this brilliant con artist. Yeah. He actually made up the entire thing like he didn't do any of the cons he's famous for and so I, it's like a con within a con so yeah. when he when he turned me down initially when I first started the podcast I actually bought into his lies I had thought that his cons were real and right. then when he rejected me I started looking into it and I found this guy named Alan Logan who did this expose on him yeah. I teamed up with Alan Logan and realized that none of it was real I mean I have his uh prison record right here. I keep it by my desk. It's, you know, it just shows that uh, I have it upside down, but it just proves that he was in prison the entire time. He was supposedly a doctor, a lawyer, pilot, 
uh, professor. God yeah. knows what else he claims. Yeah. yeah. How far do you get like, I love to do research. Whenever I have a guest come on, research is one of my favorite things. And I like, I have so many different places I go. How mm -hmm. deep do you get into research? Oh, deep and not deep enough, right? So like yeah. deeper than most people. <laughs> okay, so this is uh, another thing I keep on my desk. I'm just showing you things I keep on my desk now. Yeah. So this is uh, my friend's book is uh, OSINT Techniques. So it's a book that that shows you how to find publicly available information that's on the web. And I'm talking about like that's reach databases, phone numbers, yeah. social security. Number. I can find out all kinds of things about you that is already littered all over right. the web. Right. Metadata and photos. You'd be surprised how much information you could get from it. Like when was that photo taken? Oh, right. well, that's a big piece of information or or where is this IP address originating from? You know, right. like this is all information that I'm looking for when I'm uh, investigating a case. Interesting. Like I, I could just imagine the things you could probably uncover and just what you could find. I'm not even that good at it. And so I rely on friends in, in the OSINT community, the open source intelligence community yeah. to help me out. So like I, I have a stalker case right now that's fascinating if you yeah. haven't listened to it. It's if you thought the Avignel stuff was interesting, this stuff is really yeah. um, fascinating. And I had a white hat ethical hacker who's really into this kind of stuff yeah. help me dig up information about all the characters in this story trying to figure out who the stalker could be and we we learned information that you know that this person one of the suspects has five devices five active devices that she had not disclosed to anybody could that be the stalker you know like so we're using available data to 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 come up with new evidence yeah. and this evidence that i come up with i turn it over to law enforcement when i think it's necessary wow. yeah yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Now, how do you like when you're working these and you're actually getting to talk to con artists, how do you convince some of these con artists to get to, to actually have conversations with you and actually yeah. like get into it? Yeah, that's that should be the, the Achilles <laughs> heel of this podcast, right? So I approach somebody and they type in Javier and then pretend, oh, wait, this podcast is about con artists. Yeah. I'm not a con artist. Why would I talk to this guy? So you would think that that would be yeah. the end of my podcast there. But actually, con artists, uh, not all of them, like some of them don't want to talk to me. One of them told me to take a long walk off a short pier, but yeah. but a lot of them want to clear their name or get their side of the story out there. Mm -hmm. And a lot of them take a lot of pride in, in the work that they do. But I think that the reason why I'm successful in talking with con artists, and even I, I've even had a an interview with a serial killer that lasted like I would talk to the serial killer from his jail cell for for days, like oh. weeks at a time. And oh. and you're like, why would these people talk to you? And it's because I think that I'm talking to them at a respectful level. You know, yeah. I'm not dismissing what they've done, but I'm not judging them, you know, and I give them an opportunity to talk. And I think that there's a lot of value in hearing them out because you get to learn about the way they think, what motivates yeah. them, yeah. you know, so there's a lot of knowledge that you could derive from a lot of the interviews that I do. Very interesting. I, I think it's so fascinating when you get to hop into people's minds like this, because you're just like, what, what is making you tick? Like, what yeah. is it yeah. that is getting you going right now? Right, right. And so I find it so fast. I'm not a true crime person either. But when I get to hear stuff like this, I'm like, how how is this possible well and and that's the key because i'm not a true crime person and yeah. so my podcasts aren't bloody and gory you yeah. know yeah. and that's what i don't like about true crime but the the psychology and yeah. and the motivations behind that i could get behind that i'm yeah. all about that and and that's i mean even the, my season with the serial killer right? there's very little graphic content in there yeah. Right. Well, and I think that's what's so fascinating about con artists too. You truly like it is very uh, a psychological thing that you're just diving deep into. And some are similar in some ways and some are very different. Like right. some have that past, whether it be childhood trauma or whatever it may be. It, it's very interesting to see what 
um, like leads people down mm -hmm. a sort of pathway to get to what they're doing. For sure. Is there any part of this when you're recording these episodes, like how are people getting away with these things or like, are people actually believing these things when they're happening? I think that um, I'm not actually, I, I have the opposite reaction. I go with it with the approach of thinking that anyone could be a victim of a stock okay. of a, of a con artist, anybody, including myself and you every, and yeah. if you think that you're not, you're probably uh, more susceptible. Right. Yeah. So that's not the approach that I take it, but I think that, that it, it is interesting to see those patterns that you were talking about yes. and go with that approach that, Hey, you're going to learn something from these guys. You're going to learn why people write to me and they're like, Oh, these victims are so stupid for following, falling for this. And I'm like, yeah, but you don't know until you've been in their shoes. For example, I was just, <clears throat> I don't know if you've seen the new Netflix documentary called don't pick up the phone. Uh -huh. Well, that was based off of, uh, podcast series that I did about a prank calls. They were, you know, the caller was pre pretending to be a cop and instructing managers to strip search their employees. And some of them went as far as vi sexually violating their employees. So, uh, you know, that that's the thing that, um, that people are like, I would never fall for that prank. Like I would never strip search an employee. And I think you're probably right. You probably wouldn't go as far as sexually violating that employee, but I bet you, you would take that employee into the back room. I bet you, you would search her. And at some point, you know, common sense will kick in, Yeah. but you can't judge somebody that if you have not been tangled in that web, you know, because yeah. these yeah. pranks the the last for hours, days sometimes, yeah. and and or cons. I say I call them pranks. It's just a uh, you know these situations could last a long time. And what con artists do is that they short circuit your reasoning. They create a sense of urgency so that your better judgment doesn't kick in because you're now just in this flight or flight syndrome. Yeah. You know where you're like. Yeah. And so you make stupid decisions when you're in that position and they know how to get you there. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's so funny because even when we see videos of, I think it's the popular thing, the last two years of scam callers calling to try to get whatever they can out of you to do whatever you can. And they, they do the fear of, Oh, we have your information and this has been yada, yada, yada. And we've seen a lot of that. I think in the last few years too, and so people are just acting and because of that fight or flight situation, like, oh my God, my, all my information's out there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What am I going to do? Like, I have no choice, but to listen to these people who are, right. yeah, they can help me. Yep. And yep. it's just nuts. I'm like, that's how it happens. Flipping on the other side of criminal conduct, you introduced it in the beginning, you, your fantastic partner of John Taylor. Mm -hmm. How did this one come to be <laughs> on the, uh, working with him? Um, and, you know, investigating very specific cases. Well, John has been podcasting way before I even thought about podcasting. He's, he has a podcast called Twisted and we met at a, at a local podcast made up, you know, like you and I met yes. and he, he and I were the only true crime podcasters at that meetup. And we're like, we need to work together one day. And, and we just were like, let's come up with something. And this is what we came up with. And criminal conduct has been, it's been great because he is the polar opposite of me. He's very analytical. He, even the way he interviews people, you know, he comes from a law enforcement background. So yeah when he interviews somebody, it feels like an interrogation, <laughs> you know, it's like he makes you sweat. And with me, I'm like a little bit more disarming. And I yeah. take a little, I go, uh, I go around you a little bit yeah. and circle you kind of disarm you make, make you feel like you're not being interviewed. Yes. Both approaches are, are very different, but they're very valuable in different situations. Yes. Right. Yes. Yeah. So yeah. it's a great partnership. I, I love it. You got good cop, bad cop going right on. A very, very good day. cop, bad cop. Yeah, for sure. I love that. And has there been with this, when you are investigating these or uncovering these, do you do the same thing? And if you find something, pass things off to law enforcement, if something's uncovered? Yeah, yeah, for sure. I mean, in the case of Michelle O'Connell and Eli Washtock, which was the first season of Criminal Conduct, we 
were able to complete um, forensic evidence study, like a blood spatter study that was not completed. Yeah. Um, because the person who commissioned that Eli Wash talk was murdered, right. right? And so we were able to talk to that blood spatter expert and and get her to complete her analysis. And then we turned that over to law enforcement, hoping that they would reopen the case. Unfortunately, they didn't because, you know, it's it's a sheriff's department down in St. Augustine that it was the person accused is one of their own, you know, and they have very little motivation to yeah. really look at all the evidence, unfortunately. I think on the other side of that, of what you do with pretend, that's a little bit more of a flip. It's not as as much psychological, but it's more of actual these different side of crime that you're yeah. looking at. Yeah, you're criminal conduct. I know I said I'm not a big fan of true crime and stuff like that, but criminal conduct is more traditional true crime. Nice. Um, and that was by design because that's what's really hot. And so we we want it. And that's what John really likes. He likes, he's really hardcore true crime fan. In fact, when we go visit cities together, yeah. we go to crime scenes because <laughs> that's what he likes to do. Yeah. I'm sure once again, yin and yang over here. <laughs> <laughs> we, uh, we, our last trip to Dallas, we retraced Lee R. Harvey Oswald's escape route. <laughs> oh, it was really cool. Actually. I thought it was going to be weird, but actually it was very interesting. Is there been one, like one of these cases that you've done in the past for three or four seasons that you've been like, this is nuts. Like to actually get into it with John, like this is just a little crazy that this actually happened and we didn't yeah. really know as much. Well, with criminal conduct, one, one of the things that we like to do is we like to pick cases that are a little uh, left unresolved okay. so that it gives us some room to, to yeah. move the needle. And we covered this case in season two about these uh, constables in Kentucky. Constables are are basically like they're um, they're elected officers of the law. They're kind of like little independent sheriffs. Okay. And uh, so the only way to get rid of them, you know, you have to wait for the next election cycle. And so these guys are incentivized to to seize people's properties, people that they arrest, and that's how they make money. <laughs> so like if they seize your car, your house, your boat, your motorcycle, well, your RV, they get a cut of that. So it created this incentive pro, um, for them to like plant evidence and, and do all this stuff. And so when we started working on that season, we didn't really know how it was going to end. Yeah. And all of a sudden, there was a shootout with the FBI, one of the constables died i mean it was just not during the shootout but like afterwards i mean it was just like we never saw that coming at all like when we started it for sure you're like looking around going what is going on yeah and, <laughs> and it's all happening like in real time too yeah. Yeah. so we like going into a story a little bit not knowing how it's gonna end i like that an unfinished chapter yep nice Coming away from the two that you have created, that you are part of and have had a hand in creating, in the in just in general podcasting, you've you've been in it for six years now. Where have you? I mean, everybody has a podcast now. Clearly, everybody <laughs> sure. everybody has something to talk about. Right, Where right. Have you just seen the massive growth? You were saying, you know, this isn't your full time job podcasting, but people do. Where where do you see the growth in it? I don't know. You know, I feel like I'm I'm very surprised, just like everyone else, that everyone does have a podcast, you know, and I, part of me loves that because it gives uh, it's a, such a democratized medium where anybody literally with a phone could pick up and start a podcast and have great conversations, kind of like what we're doing right now. Yeah. But at the same time, there's so many podcasts and, and you know, for a lot of for the vast majority of people, I think it's just a hobby. It's not even a money making thing. Yeah. But then there's big networks starting up, uh, you know, like NBC, New York Times has podcast networks, Wall Street Journal. And so like, you you have these big players, these celebrities, 
I feel like it's going to start moving in that direction. Yeah. I don't know. You know, I think it's kind of interesting. It's I've only been doing this for five years. I've seen such transformational change in the next in yeah. the five years that I've been doing this. I really have a hard time envisioning where it's going, really, because it's still like the wild, wild west of podcasting. It is. And I think to your point, I think now what we're seeing is a lot of people are becoming they're not independent that people are coming they're into companies like spotify or mm -hmm. like you were saying like big companies like good morning america now has three or however many so podcasts underneath them and even i mean barstool sports that's what they're they have that whole branch of podcasts underneath them i think you're seeing less of people being independent as their own podcast and standing alone and doing their own thing and more of becoming part of a corporation or a it's definitely really hard to be an independent podcaster and stand out nowadays because you're fighting against big giant corporations with huge budgets yeah you know? i think jason says it all the time he said if he's like you're not famous he said you are your podcast is not going to blow up overnight you yep. how do you stick out um, and I've, I've always carried that forward. Like, what is the thing that makes you different from everybody who does have that big budget or big brand names behind them? You know what I think the big secret is if you're like an independent podcaster that you, and you want to make it in this field yeah. is stick around. You yeah. know, I really do think the turtle wins the race in this. Yes. Uh, a lot of companies lose steam, you know, like maybe the the podcast is not as profitable as they want. So they cut it. And I, we've seen that with Spotify slashing shows. Um, you know, I think that um, if you are serious, this is a, and want to make it a career or business, invest money into it, like your own personal money, like put like like a couple thousand dollars into advertisement and and watch your show grow you know yeah. because if you can make your show grow if you pump yeah. money into it like yeah. with some capital so yes. but it is that's like it went from being like a really cheap uh hobby to a very expensive hobby it you did know? it did yeah. very quickly it did it and i especially think over covid everybody started and, and like you said you can use your phone to record i think everybody took that right. and ran with it pretty quickly right yeah. yeah yeah you are probably every time that i meet you and you are introduced you are very humble about the things that you you know how many views you get how many things you've gotten to do with pretend you have had incredible growth with pretend coming on now on the flip side of that other conversation of the other question like can you just share the growth and kind of the feelings you see like when you see that growth happening for pretend yeah it's really cool there's this uh website called listen notes and you could plug in your podcast and it, if it's big enough it shows you how how big it, it is in comparison to worldwide podcasts out there because there's a lot of podcasts and if i plug in pretend it's I think it's 0.1%. I don't know. I, I don't want to lie to you. Let me see. I don't, I remember, I don't want to say the wrong thing, but if I plug in pretend, let's see. It says that it's the 0.1% of all podcasts. So that's pretty cool. And they say that um, according to this, there's 3 million podcasts globally. And out of those 3 million, I'm not in the 1%, I'm in the 0.1%, which is really cool, but you wouldn't know that by um, <laughs> by how much I'm making, because obviously I can't afford to do this full time. But that just tells you, I think that just is symbolic of how many podcasts there are out there, you yeah. know? And even though my show, I would say is mildly successful, you know, I, I know shows that are way more successful and people that are doing it full time that hire staff and, and all that. I'm still like chugging along solo every now and then I hire an editor. Yeah. Um, but yeah, and it's a lot of work. You know, I feel like I'm burning on both ends. Yeah, I agree. I, I'm a one woman show and I, I have been for as long as 
you know, I've been doing podcasting, YouTubing for the last five years. And I have, I've always been the editor and people are like, well, don't you have people to help? I'm like, I can't, I, that money doesn't go that way. Sometimes right. you know, it's more on the actual advertising on the actual getting your name out there than you do mm -hmm. having somebody come in to help you edit or right. whatever it may be. Yep. I mean, it's a luxury to have somebody edit your show. My last question for you, Javier, I love to end it with this question, is just what inspires you? You know, I think what inspires me, what inspired me to start the podcast to begin with was other podcasts that mm -hmm. I really enjoyed. And I was like, wow, these are great storytellers. And that was like This American Life, wow. Radio Lab criminal, you know, like those were the podcasts that got me started. And now what inspires me is, is really, I mean, it always is. I tell people all the time, it's really telling stories. It doesn't need to be true crime. I, I, I fantasize about doing a podcast, almost like, a, like Seinfeld about nothing, you know, like a show where I could just meet somebody and yeah. ask them to tell me their life story. Like, I don't care as long as I'm telling a story. So the people that I interview inspire me to, to keep going, you know, and the listeners for sure. Yeah. Um, there's the fact that like, this is my hobby and people yeah. are like writing me all the time. I can't even keep up with the emails, you know, uh -huh. like I can't, I used to be able to respond to that. And but, I mean, yeah. I try, you know, but yeah. just the people, the fact that people enjoy yeah. what I'm putting out there for yeah. fun. Yeah. I think that's, that's so flattering. Yeah. I, I think I was telling you beforehand, I, that's why I did this. I love the storytelling aspect of people getting to share their stories. Cause not one person got to where they are the same way as somebody else who's doing the exact same thing. And, uh, I love the storytelling aspect behind it yeah. because it's, it's just a great, it's a great outlet for everybody to yeah. have. And so it's not surprising that everybody has a podcast, but it is, it is cool that everybody has a separate story to tell. I think everyone has a story to tell. I think some people are better storytellers than others, yes. but I think that a good interviewer could get a story out of almost anybody, yes. you know, because yeah. how do you live your life and not have a story to tell, you yeah. know? Yeah. Whether, whether you think you have one to tell that's right. actually important or not, I think is what is the battle that goes on in everybody's mind. But I, I, I agree with you. I think everybody has, right. a, has a story to tell. And not every story needs to be like this gigantic story either. I like the small intimate stories too. You yes. know, I, yeah. I actually like those a little bit more, yeah. you know, Javier, I can't thank you enough for coming on and uh, speaking with me today. And uh, if you have not listened to pretend or criminal conduct at all, they will be linked down below so you guys can go listen. And uh, I'm excited to see what the next couple seasons hold for uh, for the, both these podcasts. Uh, well, thank you so much, Danielle. This was awesome. Yeah. I appreciate the time. Thank you. Thank you. And as always, I will see you guys back here next time. Bye, y'all.